So yesterday we left off talking about circuit breakers, right? Circuit breakers. So let's talk about switches. One of the projectors is not on. Should we start the whole thing over again? I pushed the button. What else do you want me to do? All right. Yeah, maybe the circuit breaker popped. Switches. All right, so you're probably familiar with drawing some switches at this point. All right, let's try this again. All right, switches. Number one, the pole. We have a pole and we have a throw. A pole is something that I would think would be stationary, you know, like the pole right there in the middle of the room. And when I think of throwing something, I think of something that moves, like a ball. And that helps to remember that the pole is the movable part. And the throw is the part that stays put, <laughs> does not move. All right, because if I would have invented this, I would have called the throw the thing, because you say, well, throw the switch. That to me means move the switch, right? You ever heard that phrase, throw the switch? Mm -hmm. All right, that should be the thing that moves, but it's not that way, it's a complete opposite. So the pole is the movable part and the throw does not move, but the throw is the number of paths Number of paths, I'm going to say uh, per pole. Right, that make more sense. So here I have something right here. This, how many poles are there? Movable parts. Two. Two. Two, so it's a double pole. Now each pole has how many paths? Two. Two. Because it can come in here, it's going to come in here, and it can either go up to that one or go down to this one. So two, so that is a? Double pull, double throw. There we go. This one would be a single pull, single throw. Single pull, single throw. And just because it's on my notes, that one. Single pull. Double throw. <clears throat> and if I were to make one of these a triangle, what does that mean? Yeah, you got to hold it on. So, all right, it's got single pull, double throw, double pull, double throw. Do all that. Switches that are operated um, in an only in an emergency or inadvertent operation could endanger a system or aircraft. Use guarded switches. A guarded switch will look like that. So you have to lift up the cover to turn it on. When you slap the cover closed, it's going to turn it back off. I think we have talked about the battery many, many, many times. That is a what kind of battery? Single cell. Single cell. Which one's the negative? Small one that's positive, and a multi cell is. <clears throat> now, when I was a kid going to AMP school, every one of these counted as two volts. So, if the instructor said it was a 24 volt battery, guess what you did? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, four, and it counted them. I'm like, oh, come on. And so, you had to do all that. But thankfully, they changed it to this is just multi cell. So. That must have been a big schematic. Yeah. <clears throat> and this, of course, is the symbol for ground. ground. Okay. Moving right along. We already covered relays and solenoids. Yep. All right. I'm going to 
animals caught up. Look at that. One of the uh, jobs that, man, I seem to find myself doing often in general aviation was selecting wires. Of course, I was fortunate enough to work in a shop where we worked on vintage aircraft and we rebuild them from the ground up. So they were a literal basket case. You heard the term basket case? It's not a crazy person. I mean, it's literally a basket. The airplane showed up at the hangar in baskets. They were just baskets and boxes and said, here, here's the airplanes. And we put it all together. And so we would have to rewire it. And vintage aircraft, they didn't exactly tell you, they didn't, they didn't tell you at all what size wire something was. So you'd actually do load analysis on it. You'd actually um, figure out the size wire, you'd figure out the routing for the wire. You didn't do all of it. So um, something that I actually did quite a, a lot of. Um, even if you don't do that, it's really common, it's really common for, especially as GA guys, to never be happy with our airplane and they're in a constant state of upgrading. So you're adding, avionics is the thing to do. So you're adding avionics and doing stuff. So you have to select the appropriate sized wire. So aircraft wire is what we're gonna talk about. The aircraft wire is almost always white. I mean, it doesn't have to be. I've seen it in other colors. You can order it, but I don't know anybody that orders anything but white. So it's always white. Um, wire is sized by, wire is sized by American wire gauge. W wire gauge or AWG. And it's based on the cross section, based on cross section of the wire. Which is to say it's the what? Yeah. The diameter, cross section, diameter. Uh, let's see. Zero, zero, double aught is about the largest wire is about, it doesn't have to be, but that's about, that's a pretty damn big piece of wire. It's about the largest size. <coughs> and 24 is about the smallest size. I want to say when you get down to 24, there's special care and techniques where you have to uh, deal with it because it's such a breakable wire. It's not really that breakable, but you have to be careful. Uh, let me see. Approved wire. So when I say approved wire, that indicates that if you're wiring something in your aircraft, you can't go down to uh, Napa Auto Parts. What's, what's Napa stand for? Na National Aviation uh, National <laughs> Aviation Parts Association or something like that. Uh, it doesn't. All right, <laughs> approved wire uh, is generally mil spec. So I have a mil spec number on it. Uh, I would say that mil W. 22759 is most common. <laughs> It'll be printed right on the wire in green. So the wire is always usually usually comes in white with green printing. It says mill dash w dash two two seven five nine dash eighteen twenty sixteen zero zero. So it'll have your sizing after it. Uh, is usually white. Doesn't have to be. Um, the, it has a fluoro, which is flower polymer insulation. Anybody know what fluoro polymer is?
Teflon. <coughs> it is identifiable. It is identified. D E N T I. Identifiable by stamping on the wire as to part number and size. <clears throat> if it's an original aircraft wire, uh, it's not that uncommon that you'll actually have the part not, or the uh, code for what system that goes to that was put in by the manufacturer. So if you can read that, good luck. Um, for the most part, the wire that we use is copper wire. with a coating of tin, silver, or nickel. Tin, silver, or nickel. N-I-C-K-E-L. However, older wire that's installed in the aircraft Maybe aluminum. If you run into aluminum wire, it's, it's a, not a bad idea to change it out. It corrodes. When you get corrosion, you have resistance. When you have resistance, you have heat. heat. You have heat, you have fires. Alright, so use caution. Use caution when stripping the wire uh, because individual strands may break if you nick them and then if you break the wire then you just reduce the cross section, you reduce the cross section, then you're going to have a spot where it's going to heat up and you're going to have a problem at that point. So use caution when stripping wire. Um, because uh, say nicked strands will break. I want to say this one here is a Q and A question. Mm -hmm. That one? Yeah. Nice. This one is too. That. So when what was I going to say? When replacing aluminum wire with copper, a rule of thumb is to use copper wire two gauges smaller. which would be a larger number, right? That's a larger number. So if I'm going from a uh, 16, 18 would be too smaller. <coughs> but I want to say I'd be at 20 as two sizes, because I don't think they have odd sizes. So I'd be even sizes. Um, provided, provided the wire meets AMP requirements. So in other words, I have a length of wire, starter wire or something, and it's aluminum, and I don't like that, because I don't, and I want to replace it with copper. So I measure out the aluminum wire, and I should have a whole like, oh, I do. There we go, wire size. And I've got a uh, double lot there. Oh, look at there's one odd one. Wouldn't you love that? 
Double lot, two sizes smaller would be one. So the rule of thumb would say go to a one. But you have to meet the amperage requirements, which I'm going to show you how to do. So then I'm going to run a chart and a, a diag not diagnostic, but an analysis on it and make sure that the wire that I'm using meets the requirements of what I'm about to show you. Now keep in mind in aviation, it's a little weird. It's, it's almost like there's you know two sides to this. So if you're working on a vintage aircraft, um, and you'll learn about this later, there's uh, stuff made under car standards, not like automobile car, but car as in uh, civil air regulations before the FAA. There wasn't a lot of manuals or a lot of stuff produced on these aircraft, which is why we have 4313. So you're working on an aircraft that is newer, made under FAA standards, you're usually not left in the dark for a lot of this stuff. Uh, as you can say, it's about a Cub, but they don't even have electrical systems. Uh, you're working on an old Stearman or something with an electrical system. Um, you know, that's the old biplanes. And you want to replace something in there. Well, that's when I would go to 4313, and the Stearman manual is probably not going to give me any information. But, you know, I want to replace the wire on my Cessna. Uh, that was built in the 70s, well, that's different. You know, I've got a wiring diagram. I've got the size of the wires. I'm going to replace what, if I have to replace the wire, I'm going to replace it with what the parts book shows, what the manual shows. Uh, if I'm going to add some wire or if I'm going to add a component, oftentimes it's going to come with documentation, a supplement to the type certificate that will tell you exactly you need to run a wire from here to here, and it must be this gauge. And so all the guesswork's taken out of it. Some, it just depends on what you're doing and why you're doing it as to what data you're going to use. When I installed the radios in my airplane, most of it was I mean, spelled out in a manual that was thicker than most airplane manuals back in the 40s about how to install this radio and what size wire to use and what size circuit breaker and you know how long the run should be and everything else you need to know. So it just depends on what you're doing. But when you look at the tests that you're going to be taking for the FAA, it really goes all the way back to um, the older stuff and reading 4313 and knowing how to do that. I guess they assume that if you have a directions in front of you and says use a number 18 wire, you'll know to use number 18. If it's something that's like, hey, install this electrical component over there, and you're like, well, what size wire? You gotta figure it out. Uh, let's see, it's B, so wire is selected. is selected for components, for components. Components based on several factors. And I wrote right here, per the Q&A, so this is my data for that. So according to Q&A, these are the things. Allowable power loss. What the heck does that mean? Voltage drop. Yeah, what? Voltage, Voltage drop. <coughs> that was one of the questions that you have to answer in your uh, project sheets. You know, what, what are the considerations for wire? And one of them was, um, well, there were four things. What was the question? It was temperature, cross section, length, of the wire. length material. and material. Yeah, and so when you factor in these things, you got to consider that. Allowable power loss, um, which this to me is synonymous to that. Permissible voltage drop. If you got a voltage drop, you got a power loss. They're one and the same. Um, carrying capacity. Or, I'm sorry, current. Current, C U R R. Current carrying capacity. The wire, the wire, and type of load. Whether it is continuous or intermittent.
All right. Continuous or intermittent. What's a continuous load? No. Something that's always on. What's something that's always on? Or would be on for a long time? The propeller. Very good. If you do have an electric propeller that's always on. Radios? <laughs> yeah, radios would be a good example. GPS. Talk on it and let it turn it off. I'm done talking. GPS. How about nav lights? I don't use them all the time, but when I do use them, they're on for a while. The uh, battery, technically, yeah, the battery itself is, is a continuous load because once you start it up, that's a good one. Uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, per AC4313, um, 11.68 delta, intermittent. Intermittent load. Um, is, Sorry, can you the numbers after AC4313? 11.68 delta is a maximum of two minutes. So given that, would you consider a landing light? Would you wire that for intermittent or continuous? Very good. How about landing gear motor? Intermittent. Intermittent. If it takes two minutes to put your gear down, you probably have a problem. That's right. So yeah, you just placarded at that. Turn off, turn off a landing gear motor every one minute and thirty seconds. <clears throat> Flat motor. What do you say? Flat motor. Intermittent. Intermittent. Doesn't take two minutes to get them down. Uh, so then, therefore, continuous. Is more than two minutes. All right, I've got a note here. It says mechanical strength. Mechanical strength. I wrote in parentheses, although not the right answer on the Q&A. A lot of times, oh man, the FA is terrible. I'm studying for my instrument, and so I'm going through all these questions, and I'm doing it. I'm like, no, it's... The one that I hate, did you guys have your instrument? It's all the holding patterns. <coughs> you got to figure out the entry to the holding pattern. Yeah. And so I'm getting the right answer. I'm like, ah, it's, I know what this is. It. And, and I get it wrong. And then when I read the explanation, it says, yeah, technically it should be an answer I selected. However, the FAA has been scoring that one as wrong and putting this one as right. Like, all right, I can't, you can't. I'm just like, I'm getting it wrong then. I can't memorize the wrong answer. I don't know. <laughs> all right, uh, so mechanical strength. Uh, wire that is too small can break. Wire that, I shouldn't say too small. I mean, if it's the right size, that means it's just small. Wire that is small, we'll say that small. Um, it can break, it can break. When under mechanical load. In other words, you tie up something to the wire. And as mechanics, we're guilty of doing that. You got a wire bundle running through, and you're like, oh, that's a nice little bundle. I'll just tie this, you know, control cable thing to that, or, you know, something like that. Not an actual control cable for a, like an aileron or something, but like an engine control cable where it's in a housing. And like, oh, let's tie it all together. And then you put the stress on the wire, then the wire breaks. So you don't want to do that. Um, when using less than 20, less than a 20 gauge. So what wire would that be? What's smaller than 20 gauge? 24. <coughs> Special consideration. Uh, 
uh, in clamping to prevent breakage. All right, let's talk about allowable voltage drop. Uh, yeah, I feel like I should say something about this mechanical strength and requires special consideration and clamping. I don't know if I say it in here. It's kind of a big deal when you're running items in an aircraft. And again, if you're usually working on I take it back. There's been many times in my own airplane where I've had to decide how I was going to run a piece of wire. And oftentimes you have running along with wires, you have control cables, you know, actual cable that's moving control surfaces. You stay the hell away from those. Uh, you don't want the two rubbing against each other. That's bad. Uh, but you'll see fuel lines. You're running alongside fuel lines. And so when you're running uh, electrical wires and fuel together, so it becomes a big deal. So we have a fuel line. And then it's which fuel has at least wire, you know, blue fluid through there because it's the fuel. Where are you going to run the wire? And the wires are white, so I'll use white. No. You know, should the wire be below or should the wire be above? So you say wire above. Why above? What's that? If fuel line breaks, it won't drip fuel onto the wire. What happens if fuel drips onto the wire? Well, I have to look at it like this. If the fuel drips on the wire, the fuel can have an effect on the shielding, the Teflon coating, and break down the coating. So that's how I remember it. Otherwise, you can get confused, and i got to be careful. I shouldn't say it. But, well, if you put the wire below, that, see, in this case, the sparks from the wire, where would they go? onto the fuel line. Oh, that's really bad. So wait a minute. Now, which one do I put on top? So it's, that's not the way it goes. So don't remember that one. It's, you do not want the fuel dripping onto the wire and the fuel over time will damage the insulation. That's how I remember it. And then when you're clamping stuff, uh, you know, it's a whole art to using Adele clamps, those rubber cushion clamps and how you put them in and you clamp them. You try not to clamp wires to fuel lines. You don't use fuel lines, you know, with a bunch of zip ties down. But, you know, zip ties are pretty common and we use the crap out of them. I knew a guy one time who got sued and, and lost his lawsuit. And it was somebody, he had done an annual on an airplane and the gear didn't go down. I don't know if the pilot didn't put the gear down or it didn't go down or whatever, but the gear didn't go down. And so he bellies in, and so he sued this mechanic who did the uh, inspection, the annual inspection. And uh, they thought it was a slam dunk case. It wasn't the mechanic's fault until the attorney, who was a pretty sharp guy, said, uh, can I ask you a question? What's the uh, something like mil-spec part number for, or what's the approved part number for a nylon tie? And the mechanic's like, uh. And the attorney said, uh. <laughs> and said, uh, so you used a nylon tie. Where'd you get these nylon ties? Well, of course he bought them at, you know, yeah, wherever you would have bought them. Harbor Freight. Freight. Harbor Freight, yep. And there are mil spec numbers for uh, nylon ties. If you get the right nylon ties, and to be honest, you rarely, I don't I ever hardly see them in, in the industry because we don't buy them there. We go to Harbor Freight and, you know, I don't. I think that's ridiculous. You can get a better deal on them at Costco, the big two. But uh, <laughs> am I wrong? But yeah, the mil spec ones actually, um, the ones I've seen are white and they have a stainless steel tang. Yeah, so you don't see them very often, but yeah. But uh, no, I admit I use nylon ties, but he lost that. But I don't use nylon ties in an area where if the nylon tie would break, it would cause a problem. They're just there to kind of help tie things up and make them look nice. So other than that, you're going to use real cushion clamps with screws and everything else. Uh, okay, allowable voltage drop, back where I was. Um, or power loss, if you will, same thing to me. And we are going to use 4313, 43.1, yeah, right. 43.13, um, and that's an abbreviation. It's actually like 1B uh, table. 
11-6, 11-6. All right, so let's take a look at aforementioned table 11-9. That should be 11-6 right there. Page 1, 11-2, 11-6, there we go. I don't use this one very often. All right, um, and I'll show you why not in a little bit. Tabulation chart, allowable voltage drop between bus and utilization of equipment ground. So let's dissect that voltage drop between the bus. Bus is usually the, the hot, the power, the power bus, um, and utilization equipment ground. In an aircraft, unless it's a plastic airplane, you don't, run another wire all over the place it's just you know if i got a flat motor i got a power wire runs to the flat motor there's the flat motor it's either got a wire about yay long that goes off of it and goes to a bolt right there or it's internally grounded and part of the bolt up project uh, process so uh but anyway so we got um uh, level voltage drop so system voltage 14 continuous you can go half a volt intermittent one for 28 one and two 115, 4 and 8, 7 8. All right. Um, so there's our allowable voltage drop, 4313. You know which book that is, right? All right. Um, Question. Yes. Utilization equipment ground. That was a terrible have, sentence. <laughs> if you have the piece of equipment between there and you haven't engaged it, you could have infinite resistance. Or a motor, a motor coil resistance or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you would. So if it was a motor, good luck. You're not going to measure that resistance very well. The way I would do this is just me yeah, measure the drop that you're getting. But you have to measure it over the whole run, which is really hard. Yeah. So if this is a servo motor in the tail, well, you take a measurement reading at the front, and you take a measurement reading at the back while you're operating it. That's how I would do it. Measurement at the front while operating, measure at the back. You guys follow what I'm saying? All right. So we're asking, how would you know the, the drop? You know, are you going to take your voltmeter and have a whole bunch of little clampy things all the way? No. So if I had a wire and I was running it to the, well, first of all, I'd hate to run a wire all the way to the back, then realize I had the wrong drop. So that's why I said I don't use this chart very much, and I'll show you why, because there's a better chart that will help you out. But it's there. Uh, where was I? Uh, resistance of the wire will increase. Of wire will increase as as what? Length. Length increases or. Yep. Diameter decreases. A uh, funny thing. As A and P mechanics, and I don't know why this is, you're expected to have a knowledge of wiring to a certain level. If you're an IA, you take it to the nth degree, which makes no sense whatsoever why they would want an IA to have far more knowledge of this stuff than an A&P since we all do the same job and I'm just approving what you did. How can I approve what you did if you're not aware of this knowledge? So on your test, I'm gonna show you the stuff you have to know. On the IA test, it got stupid. Um, it was very difficult in figuring wire because you got into temperature and pressures and you had to compute those in with whole different charts and it was like, wow, this is a whole nother level here. Uh, okay, 14 volt system. Uh, do that. So allowable voltage drop. Uh, we already looked at that. We had four, the 14 volt system. Remember what it was? Yep, 0 0.5 for con volt drop continuous. Continuous is what? How long? more than two minutes and one volt for for intermittent
Get them in use. I can put that. More than two minutes. So we remember. And less than. So you're thinking, wow, what if it's exactly two minutes? Well, technically, the answer for continuous is two minutes or more. I just put more than two minutes. And we have the 28. We don't need to do that. We do have to do location. Location. Consideration. Location of the wire, that is. Where are you going to put this wire if you're selecting a wire to do something? Is it in free air? Is it in expensive air? Free air means not in a bundle. So the opposite of that would be a bundle. What is the temperature? Um, I had to, I put a magnetometer out on the wing of my aircraft. I had to run a wire all the way out to the wing of the aircraft. So I had to think about that. Is it in free air? <coughs> Kind of. It's not out in the air. It didn't run the outside of the wing, ran it inside of the wing, but it's right inside the wing and there's you know holes in the ribs going all the way down the wing. Well what's next to it? Ah, for about yay far there was a there's some few other wires with it. And then for the rest of it, no, I had the landing lights. So I ran it with a landing light wire. So is that a pre air or a bundle? Yeah, if it's just two wires I wouldn't so much call it a bundle. You know, I'm thinking bundles like that or like that, where you, you know, you can't even see the wire in the middle. To me, that's a bundle. If you can see the wire, that's more of a free air. You just gotta be careful with that one. Um, temperature, does it get hot running through the middle of the wing? Today it would, but other than that, no. It's usually up where it's cool when it's running, so no. If I have to run it through the firewall, and I'm doing like landing lights out in the front of my, they're on my cowling. So I gotta run the wire around the outside of the cowling and it's about yay far from the exhaust. And it's pretty hot, so. All right, uh, determining the correct wire size. All right. We are going to use, use chart. This is 4313, use 4313 chart. 11-2 for continuous. Or chart 11-3 for intermittent. Once you understand one chart, you understand them both. There we go. Can you see that okay? No, nah, numbers are going to be hard, but I'll try and help you out on that. All right. Um, this is something I would write down, but now I'm on this screen. It says, note that these charts keep from exceeding the maximum voltage drops. We talked about the voltage drop a little bit ago. There was that chart. I said, ah, I don't really use this chart. I'll tell you why I don't use that chart is because they're really nice and they put it right there. So first of all, let's look at something here. This is chart. Which one? Is it the continuous or the intermittent? Continuous. It's the continuous, 11 2. It says continuous right there. So if there's any question about it, you can try and read that. It says continuous flow. So which one we got here? Continuous, continuous which means it's time wise? More than two minutes. All right. Now it's so for continuous, continuous voltage for 14 volts. Do you remember what the continuous volt, max voltage drop was? Huh? 0.5. Well, it says right that 0.5. So all I got to do is look up here. It says 14 and scroll down here. It says 0.5. What was it for 28 volts? One volt. One volt. Well, it says it right there. I don't need that other chart. Get rid of that one. It says it right here in this one. So, all right. So how are we going to read this? I got to, there we go. Pull it back a little bit. And actually, we got to, all right. Let me see. 
so yeah, note these charts keep from exceeding the max maximum voltage drop. Already done. Also, wire is in free air, not in a bundle or conduit. It should say that somewhere on here. Voltage drop, intermittent flow, tin plated wire, uh, temperature conversion. I don't remember where it said it, but it is free air, not in a bundle. Seven two. Okay, here we go. So example, I'm going to use their example, I think here. So you must know three things. We must know three things. You have to know this. You have to know the voltage. You must know the wire run in feet. Wire run in feet. And three, uh, number amps to be carried. Amps to be carried. Three things. Got to know. If you're missing any one of those, um, you have a little bit of trouble. So, all right. Example one, a 150 watt, 150 watt landing light is to be installed in the wing. The distance from the bus to the light is 18 feet, 18 feet. The wire is not in a conduit or bundle. The aircraft has a 28 volt system. All right, we need to know three things. We need to know the voltage. What's my voltage? 28. We need to know the wire running feet. It is? We need to know the amps to be carried. The amps are? Ohm's law. Damn it. What's that, Ohm's law? How much? What am I, what's my amperage? How much? Really? <laughs> How much? 5.35? Okay. Anybody agree, disagree? 5.35. I'm going to round up to 6. How's that sound? Better be on the safe side. Um, no, I think this example doesn't do it. I think they actually leave it at 5. So. And I want to use that. So, all right. So here we go. Um, five amps. Here's my amps up here. Here's five amps right there. Five amps. We're going to use the 28 volt. That's the second column. This is wire length in feet. So we need wire length in feet. So here's 16. Here's 20. So right in the middle, that'd be 18. So that's 18. It's going to be on this line right there. Teens on that line right there. All right. So five foot line. Here's where it gets tricky is we're using this diagonal line. So that line oops, comes down, gets right there, and follow it down. And it says the wire size should be. Between 22 and 20, which one's bigger? 20, 20. so I'm going to go with 20. <clears throat> Select the larger. Can you start from 5.35? From 5.35. Yeah, I don't. Uh, what's the time? Is it? No. Um, so, like, just would you write down 10 amperage? Because it's 0.35? Uh, personally, I probably don't want 6, which would have been between these two which would have put me right here. Slightly over so slightly over 20, so it's right there on the 20 size. I probably just went 20. Okay. Go 18 if you want. Nobody's going to fault you. Just way more. Yeah, it's way more. It depends on what you're doing. Who's got a 4313 on him? Nobody? All right, whip that thing out. Nope. Right. Nah, well, I was going to go over the, these. Okay, so these right here with this circle, this, these are all examples they give you in the book. I just didn't copy them down. I mean, it says it right at the bottom there. 
Number eight wire, 20 amps. Oh, thanks. We'll just use that. Uh, clear all. Erase all. There we go. All right, number eight wire at 20 amps is the circle. So this one here, number eight wire at 20 amps. So here we go, 20 amps. Follow it down here. Um, doesn't tell me what voltage or anything. Uh, number eight wire at 20 amps. Number eight wire. The problem is, look at your maximum run. Or determine your maximum run. Yeah, without without the actual all the information, I, I don't remember what they're trying to do. Um, I think it's yeah, figuring out the maximum run. So. What's that? There's a for yes, there is a formula. Congratulations. We're going to go over that in just a second. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, I guess now is the time. So my example number two. Oops, I did not want to do that. But you wanted me to do this one again. Um, the 5.35. So I need to know, so I had 28 volts. Well, you just make up anything. I have 28 volts. Uh, what, what do you want the wire run to be? How many feet? 15. 15 feet. All right, 15 foot run. And we need to know three things. Voltage. Well, how many amps? That'd be how, many, how many amps you want amps? to do? It? Just give me an amps. Somebody else give me an amps. 10. 10. So I've got 10 amps going 15 feet in a 28 volt system. What size wire do I need? All right, 28 volts, I'm gonna use the second column. Um, I've got 10 amps, there's my 10 amp line right there. And it's gotta go 15 feet, so 15 feet. So look down here, here's 16, here's 14. We'll just use the 16 right here. So it's this line, follow it so far, okay. Here's the 10, 10 is on the diagonal, so that goes right there. Now go down, and what size wire do I want? It's not hard. The FA asks you stupid questions like, what's the maximum length of wire you could have if you're doing this? It's like, why would I ever want to know that? <laughs> I need to know where the component is and how to get power to it, not where do I put this because I've only got that size wire? You know, it's like, that would, that would be like that. You have a servo motor that takes five amps and you only have six feet of a certain wire. Where would you put the servo motor? <laughs> now I'll put the servo motor exactly where it goes and buy the wire that matches it. All right, uh, let's see. Erase link. What do I got next? Um, example number two, what if it's over 20 degrees Celsius? So now I've got something that's over 20 degrees Celsius. And that's what, let me pull this up here. Length is based on conductor temperatures of 20 degrees to determine length at higher conductor temperatures. Use the formula or T2 is estimated conductor temperature. So, you want to write down that formula? L2 equals 254.5 times L1 divided by 2345.5 plus T2. Nope. It's as high as it goes. The limitations of PowerPoint. I'll write it down. Don't worry about it. I'll write it. Let's see. Break time. <laughs>